remember, this is a prediction for 20 years from now. This would be June 12th, the year 2006. Holy cow, can you believe that, the year 2006? When I think of any year in excess of the year 2000, I think of science fiction. I just cannot grasp it in my mind. I cannot see human beings living in a year in excess of 1999. Just does not click. I came across this video a while ago on Reddit and it really piqued my curiosity about past predictions of the future, especially when said future is now our past. I frankly love this video. I don't know the full name of the guy who made it, but judging by the name of the YouTube channel, I'm going to assume he goes by Mike. I love his enthusiasm, I love his curiosity, I love his bow tie. The link to his original upload will be listed below. I really recommend checking it out. There's a certain likability to these kinds of videos. They're overly optimistic and overly ambitious in some ways, but also not ambitious enough in others. They can be comforting because they're familiar and nostalgic. They show an alternate version of our present without our present struggles. For almost as long as humanity has been recording history, we've also been trying to predict it. There's a million videos out there of people from some point in the past trying to make a prediction about the future. Originally, this video was going to be a lot more focused on that, but the further that I delved into it, the more that I realized that this video is actually about nostalgia. In this video, I'm going to use popular culture to illustrate how we romanticize the past and how that affects the way we think about our future. I explored different avenues like art, movies, music, and fashion, along with my own personal experiences, so bear with me as it all comes together. Do keep in mind that this is just my own thoughts and opinions, so let me know if you have anything to say in the comments below. Feedback is always welcome. But first, a word from our sponsor. Did you know that 90% of the people that watch this channel are not subscribed? This doesn't hurt my feelings. I'm a grown man. but. It does hurt Mila's, and you wouldn't want to hurt Mila's feelings, would you? But seriously, if you're enjoying the video, please consider leaving a like and a comment down below. It really does help a smaller channel like myself get noticed. I have a PayPal link down below as well if you're feeling generous. Any support is, of course, very, very appreciated. Let me know in the comment section down below if you made any predictions about the future in the past that you kept track of. I also want to hear any predictions about the future that you might have right now. But without any further ado, let's get on to the video. Thank you, Mila! On the surface level, we look at predictions like Mike's because they're interesting. We want to see what they got right and what they got wrong. But it occurred to me in watching those videos that they're a lot more telling about the past than they are about the present. We imagine the future in the context of our current struggles, what we want to see addressed, what we want to see expanded. We carve the future in our own image. Often these predictions can be remarkably close to what we actually have today, but with a sort of mix of the technology from whatever period they were made in that makes it this fantastic little concoction of old and new. Past predictions of the future are usually coded with a veneer of retrofuturism, this sort of science fiction-esque perception of where humanity is headed but framed through the lens of 1950s Americana. This has resulted in a lot of really cool art. For this video, I took a look at the work of Bruce McCall, an illustrator known mostly for his work with New Yorker magazine. In the 1950s, McCall worked for Ford Motor Company's advertisement division, making these wonderful car paintings. Eventually, McCall takes his talents to National Lampoon and the aforementioned New Yorker magazine. I work a lot in what I call retrofuturism, which is looking back to see how yesterday viewed tomorrow, and they're always wrong, always hilariously, optimistically wrong. Um, and the, the peak time for that was the 30s because the depression was so dismal that anything to get away from the present into the future and technology was going to carry us along. You can tell that McCall's time with Ford really influenced him as he continued to feature cars significantly in his work throughout his career. Flying cars have always been a big part of our future predictions because of things like the Jetsons and Blade Runner where they're featured prominently. The funny thing is that human beings are fickle. 2023 might seem like the far-flung future in 2010, but today it quite literally is the present. Happy New Year. Whether it's a future utopia or a future dystopia, it's always still the future. 
In reality, if Terminator or Blade Runner didn't have to specify when their idea of the future was for the sake of the narrative, we would still think of them as taking place after our current present. McCall described retrofuturism as a distraction from our current struggles and a look at the technology that will carry us into the future. My favorite cover that McCall did is called The Ascent of Man. This cover displays different important eras in humanity leading up to the present. My favorite part of this is the guy at the end falling off of the escalator. This speaks to our own inability to handle the present and how tumultuous life feels while we live through it. It's hard to be objective about our own time. People from the past likely felt similar to how we feel today, but that's not how we remember it. I've always been really drawn towards this art style personally. Growing up as a first generation immigrant, I had a lot of romanticized notions about American culture and the nuclear family. In his TED talk, McCall also touched on the idea of faux nostalgia, which he described as yearning for a past that never happened. It's no mystery then why 1980s nostalgia is so popular in the fiction of today. We idolize times of prosperity like the 50s and the 80s because of their perceived stability. In what seems like a fairly tumultuous and cynical period in American history, it's understandable to see why people from Generation X, such as my own parents, find comfort in media that reflects their childhood. Not only were the 80s a time of true prosperity for most middle-class Americans, people who grew up in the 80s will look at that period with rose-tinted glasses because they were children. And this isn't unique to Gen Xers whatsoever. I think the best way to illustrate this point is through the It franchise. Stephen King is famous for inserting himself into his novels by making the main character an author. The It novel and its original film adaptation depict a young boy named Bill in 1950s Maine who grows up to be a successful horror writer in the 1980s. Can you think of any other successful horror writers from the 80s who grew up in 1950s Maine? Because I sure can't. The most interesting part of this is that the modern IT film adaptations that came out a few years ago depict Bill as a boy who grew up in the 1980s and ends up being a successful author in the modern day. I truly love this change because it highlights how the stories we tell and the media we consume is so deeply rooted in our own childhood experiences. The day before I wrote this script, I had the pleasure of watching The Fablements, which is a semi-autobiographical film by Steven Spielberg. The film shows how in his youth, Spielberg was influenced by awe-inspiring classics filled with righteous heroes. It's clear how deeply this impacted Spielberg. In a long and diverse career, Spielberg's work has been consistently sincere and earnest. It was incredible to see where this approach came from. Seeing how one of the most prolific and influential film directors of all time got his start in filmmaking was genuinely a huge pleasure. To me, it didn't feel like nostalgia bait or self-aggrandizement. It felt like an old man reflecting on his youth in a very therapeutic way. Like anyone else, Spielberg's work is very informed by his childhood influences. Side note, please watch this movie. It made me tear up, and I'm like one of three people that have watched it, so if you can, please give it a shot. In an era full of remakes and reboots, some of which are quite bad, I've come across what I would call the cycle of influence. The original Star Wars film from 1977 shared a lot of similarities with the 1965 novel Dune by Frank Herbert. So much so that back in the 1970s, Herbert told a newspaper, I'm going to try very hard not to sue. But Star Wars would become the face of science fiction, itself an omnipresent influence on any sci-fi story that would come after it. While writing about his 2021 Dune adaptation in Empire Magazine, Denis Villeneuve said, it was a very long process to find this identity in a world with the giant elephant of Star Wars in the room. George Lucas was inspired by Dune when he created Star Wars. Then, as we were making a movie about Dune, we had to negotiate the influence of Star Wars. It's full circle. It's funny when new adaptations of previous works like Dune and It have to coexist with works that are influenced by their source material. To demonstrate this, let's take another look at the It franchise. Stephen King released It in 1986 and its original film adaptation in 1990. One of the producers of the new It movie, Dan Lin, stated, I think a great analogy is actually Stranger Things, and we're seeing it on Netflix right now. It's very much an homage to 80s movies. Whether it's classic Stephen King or even Spielberg, think about Stand By Me as far as the bonding amongst the kids. But there is a really scary element in Pennywise. 
In 2016, Netflix released Stranger Things, heavily inspired by the initial outing of the It franchise. The new It reboot would then be released in 2017, which drew a lot of comparisons between the two considering how they even share one of their stars. While these two properties seem to have come out independently of each other, they no doubt capitalize on the same trends. If people of my generation and my parents' generation can't achieve the previous prosperity that we romanticize so much, it makes sense that we would retreat into these depictions of the past. The past will always be something that we romanticize and put on a pedestal, but sometimes the way that people talk about the past kind of gets on my nerves. People always talk about these darn kids and their phones, these darn kids and their televisions, these darn kids and their radios. Man, they just don't make them like they used to. You kids today don't know real music! I was born in the wrong generation. I would argue that this is mainly because of two things. Number one is that bad or mediocre media is often very forgettable. Sometimes the opposite happens, where something is so bad that it's good, such as You just got Rickrolled in 2022. You're welcome. Hi, Andre from the Editing Bay here. I wrote the script before the new year and am now realizing that I forgot to change it. So yeah, joke's on me. I guess I'm really the one who got Rickrolled in the end. Or maybe not Rickrolled, maybe just rolled. Thank you, enjoy the rest of the video. Number two is that coming of age is often a very lasting and memorable experience. We go through so many phases and emotions that the music we heard in those moments are always going to be exceptionally powerful and personal for us in a way that the music we hear later in life might just not be. And that's okay. You can listen to whatever music you want and you should be able to cherish those memories. I just don't like when people put down other people's interests. This is one of my favorite shirts. It happens to depict the famous Miles Davis art. While I love this shirt and I wear it quite often, I don't really know much about Miles Davis and I wouldn't even consider myself really a Miles Davis fan. I just like the shirt. Last year, I was out to lunch on a little restaurant at the beach, and this older man, probably in his 50s or 60s, walked by. I heard him exclaim, Your shirt is awesome! You give me hope for your generation! And I have mixed feelings about this. It's great for you to feel a kinship with somebody because of a potential shared interest, but the framing of the statement, which puts down my generation and somehow holds me above it for liking something older, really rubbed me the wrong way. This is especially funny since older things are very popular with people my age. I'm sure you're familiar with vintage and Y2K fashion. I'm guilty of this myself. I'm quite a big fan of the vintage look. At first, I was going to say this had more to do with the clothes just looking good rather than being vintage, but I'm not sure if that's actually true. See, what we call nice clothes tends to be very expensive. Sometimes it's because they're higher quality, but sometimes it's just because they're more exclusive or unique. In a landscape where clothing is really mass produced and it's frankly kind of hard to dress in a unique way without breaking the bank, secondhand or thrifted clothing makes a lot of sense. We all express our identities through how we dress, and a common part of people's identities is how unique we are. Up until I was about 17, I was pretty anti-fashion. I just wore a graphic tee showing something that I liked along with whatever pair of pants or shoes that I had and that was it. The ironic thing is that this attempt to not care about how I dressed was actually me caring a lot and doing so in a very pretentious way. I'm not like you other people. I don't care about how I dress. I just dress however. Please think that I'm special. I promise this is relevant. <laughs> Like I said before, we all want to be unique, and an easy way to do that is by holding on to things that we consider part of our identity. Whether it's the movies we watch, the music we listen to, or just the time period in which we grew up. I was always really into Star Wars and superheroes, forms of media that had their root in altruistic early 20th century comic strips and serials. I'm nostalgic about media influenced by other people's nostalgia, influenced by other people's nostalgia, and so on. We tend to be nostalgic about the past and hopeful about the future while neglecting our own modern day. 
all his life as he looked away to the future, to the horizon, never his mind on where he was, hmm? what he was doing. We're almost as far away from 2006 as Mike was when he recorded his original video. Now, 1986 and 2006 seem a lot further apart to me than 2006 and 2026. This might be because I was alive in 2006, but also a new millennia just feels like a really big change. A couple of days ago, I was having a conversation where I said something along the lines of, man, if I live to be 99, I'm going to see the year 3000. Isn't that amazing? To which my younger cousin replied, your math is wrong. And I was like, oh yeah, that's why I'm a humanities person. <laughs> the reality is if I live to be 99, I'm going to see the year 2100, which is still insane. I'll try my best to make it there. I look at the year 2100 in a similar way to how Mike looked at the year 2000, although Mike got to see the year 2000 as a much younger man. <laughs> as someone who has always lived in the 21st century, anything before that just seems older by default. Me and others of my generation will likely live our entire lives only changing the last two digits of the year. I was talking to an older man in his late 80s or early 90s a couple of years ago, and he told me that his dad was born in 01, 1901, a whole 100 years before myself. This really put time into perspective for me, looking at the differences between my own life and the life of someone born just 100 years prior. Technological innovations have been happening faster and faster since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. The internet has been one of the most defining factors of the 21st century so far, and it's hard to grasp just how far its impact will reach in the coming decades. I can't predict the future, but what I can do is live in the moment and do these sappy little video essays. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoy the content, please consider liking and subscribing. I wanted to leave you with the question, what's a time in your life that you're nostalgic about? It could be related to music or a form of media or just an event that was really important to you. I'm genuinely curious and I really want to know, so if you leave it below, maybe we can have a conversation. Once again, thank you for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the content.